Good evening and welcome to the Quarry Valley Unified Union School District November 15th meeting. If you would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The first order of business is the approval of the agenda. Are there any additions, deletions, or changes to the agenda? Hearing none, a motion would be in order to approve. I'll make the motion. Lisa, did, did we want to add personnel to, to executive session? Do you want to do that? Probably, it's but I, however you want to organize it's fine. Okay, I, I just was asking because I know there's a question just, about that. We should probably have it before we have the public discussion on that, just so everybody knows what the deal is. Or do you want to just move it to executive session and then we could just have it at the end? Sure, we could do that. Yep. All right. Um, so we're going to move the contract recommendations to executive session. So with that change, um, Mike makes a motion to approve. Is there a second? Nope, I'll second. Second by Sarah. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. General public comments. Is there anyone joining us that wishes to make a public comment at this time? Seeing none, we'll move on. Old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none. New business. Any new business to come before the board? Moving on to the consent agenda. Approval of minutes, October 18th. A motion would be in order to approve the minutes. I'll make the motion. I'll, make the motion. Mm -hmm. I'll second that. Motion by Nate, second by Mike. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Approval of warrants. You receive your warrants in your GRCSU email. All questions should be directed to Lewis. A motion will be in order to approve the warrants. My work quiet group this evening. I'll also move to approve the warrants. Motion by Sarah. Second. I'll second. Second by Nate. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Superintendent's report. Chris. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Uh, as you can see, it is a lengthy report, so I'll just go through a couple highlights. Uh, I first just wanted to congratulate uh, Proctor, the Proctor High School girls varsity soccer team on, uh, I know Jen, I'm probably stealing your thunder, but you can, <laughs> you'll do a much better job of, than I will, but I just want to congratulate them on a three-peat. Uh, they, uh, they won a couple, uh, two weekends ago, uh, so congratulations to them. Uh, I, I'll stop there, Jen, I'll let you kind of go into all the details out of that, so. Uh, I also want to just uh, just kind of quickly touch upon the test to stay. We did start uh, this today at our schools. Um, I want to say thanks to the administrators, the nurses, the staff members, uh, the parents uh, for all their hard work, their patience and understanding. Uh, I know it's not something we've been talking about, but uh, I was fortunate I was over at West Rutland today, uh, you know, just kind of watching this and it was like a, a well-oiled machine. Uh, I know we heard some positive things about the other schools as well, but um, we were able to do through this across the SU, keep 80, 88 kids back into school. Uh, and I think that's what one of the positives of Test to Stay is that uh, prior to this, that we would have had 88 students 
uh, sitting at home uh, trying to figure out what their education looks like, but uh, through the hard work of our administration, the staff, uh, the nurses, uh, you know, like I said, the families, uh, you know, we were starting to kind of see a, a bit of a change in how we can respond to this. And uh, I, I, like I said, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, but uh, I know that some pa today parents were frustrated some of our schools with the response times and uh, some parents had to wait a little longer. Uh, we are working through logistics and through some kinks. It is day one. I think with each iteration we will get better. Uh, we'll, you know, you know, lessons learned from today, we'll uh, use that to you know, apply it to all of our schools you know, you know, for day two and uh, three or four of our schools tomorrow, but um, you know, it looks to be a positive thing. I'd also want to remind uh, our families that this is also dependent upon a supply chain. Uh, that you know we are, uh, you know, we, we do rely upon the state to provide us with these antigen tests. And right now, we we've been very fortunate that we have a good supply to get us through the next couple of weeks. And hopefully, that uh, you know when we re uh, that supply you know starts to you know, whittle down, they'll replenish it with us. But it's not just as simple as us going to Walgreens or Kenny Drug and picking up uh, tests. We we do have to rely on uh, the state to provide this. So uh, you know, like I said, our, our goal is that this will continue for as long as we need to. Um, but uh, like I said, just you know, we're just encouraging you know patience. Uh, one of the concerns that was expressed by uh, family about Test to Stay was uh, what that would do in terms of just uh, prioritize. Uh, you know, our, our, where our priorities would lie with school. Right now, test to stay is the, the number one priority. Uh, surveillance testing is something which we still would like to have. I know that if, you know the winter sports guidance talked about if there was an unvaccinated um, student athlete that they would be, have to do uh, undergo weekly testing. So we'll look at surveillance testing there. Uh, and also we're waiting to hear back from the state uh, with regard to a, a potential vaccine mandate for employees. If that's the case, then if there's a, a, a staff member who uh, could not be, you know, be vaccinated for whatever reason uh, that there would be weekly testing. So uh, our priority is still going to stay with tests to stay because, like I said, our goal is to get the kids back and do uh, in the class and minimize disruptions. So, uh, you know, that, that it's not going to change. Uh, a couple other things. I you know, said so there's a winter sports guidance. We all should have uh, received that and um, take a look at that. But our goal is to get uh, families back into uh, into the gyms to watch uh, our you know our kids play participate. <clears throat> I think it's important not just for families but also for the students. Uh, but what we do ask is just that uh, you know we, we have to wear masks. That's just something that's you know we're, we're requiring all families to do. You know, you know uh, audience members, uh, please you know like I said you know, that's just in order for us to have the kids play participate. Mm -hmm. That's just something we, we we're asking everybody just that one little sacrifice. I know uh, I you know. It frustrates me wearing a mask, you know, all day long, and when I'm out to other places as well. But it'd be important for us just to, you know, when you're at the game, you know, whether it be Proctor or West Rutland or Pulteney or uh, any one of those facilities, whether it be a fifth, sixth grade game or a varsity game, uh, please just wear the mask and just do the things we need to do. Just, uh, you know, you know, it'd be great. So uh, the rest of really is just, you know, other things along the lines of. We just have, uh, you know, I'm sorry, one more thing. Uh, I, I'm kind of all over the place because there's a lot in this report. And I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of things to touch upon, but SBAC testing. Uh, we will be uh, releasing individual reports uh, probably the next week or so. So I think you know, we've asked, uh, you know, uh, building principals to start working with that. So the, the goal is that with report cards or during conferences, uh, that individual SBAC individual reports will be coming out. Uh, to families, uh, so your building principals have a little more information for you on that. Uh, the group reports, which I know the board is always interested in, uh, still is embargoed, so we will have a uh, group report probably in January uh, for the boards to, to review at that time. Okay, uh, And that's really about it for me. It really is a lot of long lines with uh, COVID and winter sports, yeah, as well as just uh, briefly touch upon ask back. So. All right, any questions for Chris? Chris, this is Chris Ross. I just had a question um, about the outreach for getting community participation in the um, strategic plan portrait of a graduate. Have you had any responses yet? I know that notification went out really recently, but I just didn't know if you 
had any positive response from the community about that? Uh, we have had responses. Uh, thanks, Kristen. Uh, and so we're looking at some alternate ways of communicating. Uh, I spoke with uh, Christine McGinnis this, uh, this morning about Front Porch Forum, about potentially getting on some social media, you know, get on websites as well. But uh, as most of you are aware of, that we are beginning the process of the Porch of Graduate and strategic plan for the GRCSU. Uh, it will run the length of the length of this year. There are five meetings. Uh, we do ask anybody who's interested, you know, to be a part of that, that they can attend all five meetings. And right now, uh, the first meeting will be virtual. Uh, just you know, understanding where we're at with you know in our communities with COVID and just being you know, so we're not trying to limit anyone's participation. Uh, but I think as we move into later in the year, we'll kind of wait to see what's going on and uh, where we're at, where our comfort level is. But uh, you know, if you're interested in being a part of this design team and you know, helping shape uh, the vision for not just Cory Valley, not just your schools, but the SU, uh, please reach out to your building principal or Christine McGinnis. Uh, but we will have a, a kind of a you know, multi-tiered approach to that as well, Kristen. Okay. Thanks for asking. Any other questions? Here's an observation. Thank you for uh, the data that's being put together in the principal's report, the consistency. And thank you. <clears throat> All right. And it is important for families and those that will be entering our schools to watch the games, which we certainly want community in the game, in the schools to watch the games, but to wear their masks and. Really, if we think about it as being respectful to the teams that are playing, um, that's going to ensure that we can continue to play by following those rules. So um, we certainly ask that you all wear your mask. And you know, it, it's nothing that we want to do. It's something that we need to do so that we can continue to play. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on to principal's reports. Kristen. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, everyone. Sorry my camera's off. I don't want to lose service. So as Chris said, we did our first test to stay this morning, and it did take a little bit longer than anticipated, but we did debrief after, and I think we have a very good plan moving forward tomorrow. Um, we just had to you know, work the bugs out, as Superintendent Sell said, and tomorrow I think we're well on our way to doing a better job. But I do want to thank everyone for pitching in today. Nurse Ciccarelli, Dr. Chick. Um, I had volunteers from my staff and I just, it's, it's really takes all of us and I just want to give a huge thank you to them. So um, moving right along, we do have parent teacher conferences this Thursday and Friday. Most parents have signed up for virtual ones at this time and teachers will be reviewing SBAC scores as well as jump rope information during the, during the conferences. Um, some really fun things going on. I hope you've had a chance to check out the pictures because despite everything, there's a lot of happy faces at our school and I'm really proud of the teachers and the kids for working so hard and just pulling together during this crazy time. I'd like to um, talk about our fall fest. It was very chilly. We had uh, upwards of 75 plus families. Um, and even though it got really, really cold, I think it was really successful and it was all student led. So it's, uh, it speaks a lot to the leadership of your students when they can plan and organize events and activities like that for the community. Um, PTO, you see them probably in the pictures. You can realize how cold it was. Thank you for handing out cider and donuts. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Great, thank you. Any questions for Kristen? All right, moving on to Joe, who was with us here tonight. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'll echo what Kristen was saying with our test to, or test to stay program. Um, we just had a handful of kids this morning, but it went as well as it could be. Uh, I even got trained in how to do it, so it's uh, not that difficult. It's one of those, if I can do it, anybody can do it type things. Um, our, uh, talked to, we were talking about the winter sports, and my uh, 
On my encouragement, our band concert is going to be in person. Um, our band director, Eric Ray, is going to be limiting. I uh, sent an email out this morning asking families to limit the number of people that are there. We're going to set the chairs up so people are social distancing. But, uh, you know, excited to have that coming back, and it's mid December, so hopefully <coughs> everything goes well. Um, also, last week, our students went to Castle University for a play that the Castle and students put on, and we had middle school students as well as high school students go. And I walked into the middle school class at the end of the day, asked how they liked it, and I had eighth graders telling me they loved it. Um, the one girl says, I talked through the whole thing, and I kind of looked at her funny, and she's like, No, it was a murder mystery, and we were trying to figure out who did it. So we were like trying to. So the kids were engaged. The teacher, Layla Brooks, that brought them was said it was great. Um, Abby Bennett was in our building today. We're looking at the universal screener data. There's a lot of stuff to go through. It was kind of um, a lot of information there. So I'm looking forward to desegregating all that and uh, helping our kids out where we can. Um, and I know you were asked about our senior trip. I met with our senior class advisor last month. Uh, right now there are three locations that they're looking at. They're kind of um, waiting for the class to vote on it and they're gonna start you know, planning stuff within the next few weeks trying to get dates lined up. Okay, any questions for Joe? Moving on to Christy. Thank you, Joe. Hi, good evening everybody. Um, we have a printed report. I can just give you a few highlights. Um, we were super excited to have truck or treat this year. We weren't able to do that last year. Uh, we had over 100 um, folks in the community attending between parents and students, and a lot of students, or I would say young children from outside of the park community came this year, which is a little bit different than past. We had um, the staff, I think we had four trunks um, loaded up with the staff. It was really fun, great event for sure. Um, our book fair this year, uh, we broke our records in the last couple of years. So Lisa Petrucci, our fair educator that works in the library, coordinated that. And she had time for families to sign up, um, so they were able to socially distance. They could either come after school, she stayed late a few days a week, and then students were able to shop during their library time. So she could on and off with her work. I would also like to echo the other principals and thanking the nurses. I think our nurses are putting in a ton of time um, on the weekends. I know, like, I tried to save my weekend. <coughs> But you know, my phone calls for the evenings, um, but we are tying up their weekends. Um, every weekend kind of checking in to see what the you know numbers look like for the next day. So I definitely hope all of you are very appreciative of our nurses. Um, we had our last virtual parent workshop this week. It's been um, working with a group called Changing Perspectives. So our school counselor, myself, and the coordinator have been working with families just to help families with social emotional things that are happening at home and pandemic is that and taking a toll on kids both at home and in the school. So we've been working closely to provide some free trainings for families. Um, we had, Jen, I'll let you talk about the assembly, okay? I'm not gonna say anything. So we had an assembly in Sabres of High School. I won't steal Jen's thunder because she will have nothing to talk about. Like, <laughs> So I'll let you talk about here. I just saw that. I was like, yeah, no, I won't do it. Um, again, we have parents in the conferences. We're hoping all families sign up. If families do not sign up, um, we've been having our school counselor has been like connecting with every single family because it's super important. Um, and hopefully we get a hundred percent completion. That's our goal. Uh, Thanksgiving break is next week. Um, students, let's see who they know. Same as Kristen, we'll be uh, sharing our SBAC scores um, and our mass testing. I can't see the Our enrollment is there. Does anybody have any questions or comments or anything? All right, thank you. Thank you. Jen, your time to shine. I respectfully ask to go before everyone next time. <laughs> um, so, uh, <coughs> To our Lady Phantoms, they were the, the four state champions with a 6 to 1 win over Arlington. Um, a lot of Proctor Phantoms showed up to encourage our girls. It was great to see everyone there. Um, although they pulled ahead 5 to nothing in the first half, it never felt like um, they let go or they stopped playing hard. So, congratulations to them on their repeat. Uh, 
Uh, last Wednesday, we had a school-wide assembly with a semi-concert from um, Jared Campbell. He used to open for Journey. For any of the, the kids didn't know what that was, but they did know Jason Graz. Um, and so, after the uh, day was over, I was talking to some students, and they said, you know, Ms. Nakamura, this actually feels like normal school again. So it was kind of felt good to hear something like that. And they went over to the elementary and did uh, a couple shows there. So I think he was really well received by everyone, teachers and students were telling me they loved him. Uh, and then this weekend we had our performance of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, uh, which the theater department reports it is their highest audience that they've had in a few years. So uh, obviously the COVID played into that, but even before <coughs> They felt like really encouraged by the number of fans that showed up to support their program. I also included in my report uh, some proposals for senior class trip, uh, senior banquet, and the prom. I know we have some pie in the sky dreamers out there, but I wanted to give you kind of all of the options that they were looking for um, and, and if, how much they would need to fundraise in order to do that. If the board was able to help at all, that would be appreciated. Does anyone have any questions? Yep. Thank you very much for the um, for the handouts about class trips and prompts and like that. That that'll be helpful for the board as we plan and see how we can help moving forward. Thank you, uh, Jay. Good evening, everybody. Um, we also were, as Chris mentioned, uh, we had our test to stay this morning. We thought it actually went very well. Uh, just to put it in perspective, it meant that over 20 students today did not need to quarantine, uh, so that was wonderful. Um, you can see from my principal's report that there's an enormous amount going on. Uh, everything from our Halloween parade to our Up for Learning work with the district to the uh, work with the CEL group on uh, instructional leadership, uh, virtual coffee house, virtual uh, holiday concert coming up and the return of the spelling bee. So that is all really, really good things. Uh, I've updated, Mr. Harrington has helped me update uh, all the things that we have for fundraising and also our senior class trips. Those are things that he helps oversee. Um, and, you know, just a lot going on at West Rutland School these days. I echo what Christy said. Um, I want to give a big shout out to our staff, uh, to our nurse. We had a case last week in Veterans Day, uh, or on Veterans Day, and it was all hands on deck. We had five people in the office for the vast majority of the day um, because we did not want to wait till Friday to notify parents that they would have to quarantine, and it was too early for tests to stay. So um, whatever we can do to keep the kids in school is, is what we're all doing. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for their support. It's been a long a uh, long couple of weeks, uh, even though we're only into mid-November, it's, it's, it's been an interesting school year so far. Um, did not know if folks had questions that I can answer at this time. Any questions for Jay? All right, thank you very much for your reports. We all um, appreciate how they're put together and how informative they are. And it's great to see on the cover page from everyone um, this year, all the activities that are happening in school, and I would say echo Jen students that say it does seem like there is a bit of normalcy coming back when we have plays and band concerts and, and all of these kinds of activities. It, it, it's, it's positive to see that, I think, and, and it, it's encouraging. So thank you all very much. All right, uh, moving on to personnel. Uh, we're moving uh, con Tracked recommendations to executive session, so if you could put that aside. Uh, we'll move on to, we have retirements from West Rutland for Don Chiron, um, the librarian. A motion would be in order to accept her retirement with regrets. Make the motion. Motion by Mike. Second. Kristen Rossell, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we also have in your packet a leave request 
Is there anything you want to speak to about that, Chris, or that you recommend the leave request? No, I'd recommend this leave request. All right. A motion would be in order to approve the leave request for Layla Brooks, an English instructor at Pulteney High School. Kristen Ross, I'll move to uh, approve the leave. Second. All second. Second by Nate. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. You also have in your packet for information only vacancies across the SU. And we will move on to finance. Lewis. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I have a few things on the agenda tonight. Um, I'm going to do them a little bit out of words. We'll leave budget to last. Uh, so the first one I'm going to go over is the budgeting tool. Uh, this was in the packet. We talked about this a couple months ago um, regarding uh, the discussion started with zero-based budgeting and line-by-line -line budgeting. And, and based on that discussion, uh, it was decided that uh, board members could could benefit from a little cheat sheet to use during the budgeting process. Uh, so this is done to all of the boards um, and to the GRCSU board. And it, it's just a little cheat sheet to help you through the process. It just outlines our account code structure and, and what each piece of that account code structure uh, identifies and what it means, as well as on the backs, um, some of the common items you would find uh, that fits into those most common accounts that we would use, both the function codes and object codes. Um, no action here, just, uh, just something to be used this year for budgeting, as well as future years. It should stay pretty constant throughout the year. <clears throat> yeah. Any questions? I just want to say thank you for this, Lewis. That's nice. I'm going to make a hard copy and carry it around. <laughs> the wife. All right, the next item uh, announced tuition. Uh, so each year we have to set uh, a tuition <clears throat> price for both our elementary and secondary students who are coming to our schools from out of district. Uh, so there was a, a sheet in the packet with. Uh, what the current announced tuition rate is for Quarry Valley, as well as for some of the other schools in our area, as well as my recommended FY23 announced tuition rate. Uh, so looking at that for both, let's start with elementary. Uh, so right now, our announced tuition is $15,000, uh, which um, is the same as Wealth Springs in Rutland Town, as well as Slate Valley. Um, and then Rutland City is 11,600. No River is 16,750. And the state average is $15,513. Uh, we've raised this uh, every year by about $500. Uh, I felt that our, our tuition rate is pretty um, much in line with some other schools in the area. Uh, so my recommendation would be keep it constant at 15,000. We don't get a lot of elementary um, elementary tuition students. A lot of ours are secondary, um, so that would be my recommendation. It would be fifteen thousand. Uh, secondary, uh, we currently have an announced tuition rate of seventeen thousand five hundred. Uh, Rutland Town is fifteen thousand. Rutland City is sixteen thousand seven hundred. Slate Valley is seventeen thousand. Mill River is sixteen thousand six hundred. <laughs> and the average is 16,842. And so on this one, we do have a lot of secondary students that come in to all three of our high schools, um, but due to the fact that our rate is, is the high, one of the highest in the areas, um, my recommendation would be keep that constant. Any questions? It's interesting that Mill River has a higher elementary rate than high school rate. And that would be because typically the elementary schools are smaller population, small enrollments, so it actually costs more for them to run their elementary schools than it does their high school mm. uh, because they all tuition, it, uh, because they all are part of the Union High School and it's a lot larger, the cost to run the high school is cheaper than the elementary school. All right. Any questions about 
staying the uh, tuition rate at 15,000 for the elementary and 175 for secondary. Hearing none, a motion would be in order to approve the FY23 <clears throat> tuition rate. I'll make the motion. Motion by Nate, second. Mr. Ross, all second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, so next I think we'll go to budget and we'll come back to the main <clears throat> afterwards because I think some of the budget discussion uh, will impact that discussion. Okay, so in the packet uh, was the Port Valley budget for the first draft. Uh, it should be, it's an 18 page document. Uh, the first page is the summary of all the changes um, for both the district wide as well as each school. And then you have uh, about 17 or 16 pages worth of details. And we'll, we'll go through some of that. And, and then there's some supporting information in the back. Uh, so right now, uh, just skipping just to the total and then we'll come back to the details. You can find the total budget impact is on page 14. Total expenditures are up by $762,000, which is 4.14%. And total education spending is up by $295,000 or 1.73%. So education spending is the amount we have to raise in property taxes. It's the total expense minus our local revenue. Local revenue is anything other than property taxes. So it includes any tuition revenue, any surplus revenue, and then some of the smaller revenue items such as interest income, mm -hmm. income student activity income, stuff like that. <clears throat> uh, so the, the difference between total expense and education spending would indicate that we have a large increase in revenue, which we'll go over in, in a minute. Um, so based on our discussion last month, uh, the board uh, gave us the direction to include what the administrators um, were looking for their buildings and what they identified as needs. Um, so this budget right here in front of you includes all of those um, items and, and it identifies on page one what each of those items is. So looking at page one, uh, to go over the summary of changes, district-wide level, <coughs> Special ed disallowed increased by 94,000. And this is due to an increase in estimates uh, at the SU. Uh, as, we, as we looked at the actuals last year, our special ed staff was spending more time doing regular ed uh, duties and activities, uh, and therefore had less special ed eligible time. Uh, so to be, so become more in line with actuals, we increased those estimates at the SU. Uh, SU assessments are based on uh, the first draft of the SU budget that was presented in October. Uh, we'll be looking at the second draft uh, on Wednesday. Uh, the general funds decreased, the general fund uh, <coughs> assessment decreased by 28,000 and special ed assessment increased by 53,000. Uh, Sarah, do you have a question? Sorry to interrupt, just before we get more into the weeds, and this is a, a newbie question, so forgive me. Um, uh, what is a disallow in this context? Okay, um, so we do spend a lot of time discussing this mostly at the SU level, um, but usually at year end we talk about it at the district level. Uh, so all of our special ed staff are at the SU level, uh, but not 100% of their time is spent doing special ed activities. So for example, a special ed para uh, we're budgeting, um, it's 20% of their time is doing non-special ed activities. So that would include um, working with regular ed students, doing regular ed duties such as recess or lunch duty, or, or whatever else they're assigned to do in the buildings that's not working with IEP students. So any time that they're working with non-IEP students, we call that special ed disallowed time. Uh, so because 100% of the salary is paid through the special ed budget, we then pull out that percentage as an estimate of what that disallowed time is, and then we true it up at the end of the year based on time studies that the, each staff member does, each special ed staff member. Uh, okay, uh, 
Uh, so after the assessment, uh, we have a decrease in capital debt payments of 189,000, uh, and that's uh, mainly due to <coughs> off, uh, there was a profit bond in the last payments we made this year. Uh, and it includes a 5.2% increase in health insurance premiums, which is approximately $62,000. FY21 surplus was $1.3 million, and we, we talked about that in August. Uh, so this is an item that we'll need to discuss further, but currently uh, we have language that was approved by the voters last year that allows us to put 50% of that surplus into a capital maintenance fund. And another article that allowed us to put 20% of that surplus into an athletic fund. So the budget that you have in front of you is putting 50%, approximately 50%, I just chose even numbers, 650,000 into the capital improvement fund and 20% or 250,000 into the athletic fund. That leaves a remainder of 416,000 that is in this budget as a FY23 revenue. So that's one of the reasons why our education spending is down because that surplus is higher than the previous year's surplus. So, Lewis, um, before you move on, so that 50% for capital maintenance and 20%, it w was it the wording up to that amount? So we could, if we wanted to decide later, we could go lower than those percentages you got there, but you chose sort of the maximum to give us a sense. That is, that is correct. So we'll need to discuss that during the budget process. If we feel we want to put more towards revenue and, and lower uh, the education spending amount, we can adjust those. These are sort of the maximum. Uh, and like I said, I rounded, so I, I think it was actually slightly more that we could put into this, but I just rounded to, to the whole numbers. Um, the only, so the only, um, the, one of the negative parts about putting too much as a, as a revenue uh, is that when we look at FY24 budgets, if we don't have a large surplus in FY22, then we'll have a decrease in revenue when we're looking at the following year's budget. Um, so by putting money into these funds uh, allows us to, to keep our, uh, our revenue sort of low. Uh, QB announced tuition rate at zero percent increase. That was my recommendations, which was approved tonight. Uh, we have an increase in tuition students. Uh, that we're tuitioning into our high schools and elementary schools, which is resulting in 249,000 additional revenue. Uh, and we have two students budgeted for outside placements. Those are based on team decisions. Um, so you'll find those on the tu uh, tuition payments and the district wide. Uh, looking at the school level, and I'm just identifying the, the major changes. Uh, so Pauley Elementary School has a new custodian position built in. It's actually a shared position between the elementary school and the high school. And that position is approximately 51,000. That's salary and benefits. Can you tell us how many custodians there are currently? Six positions before this position. But so one, this this one, is one's only a thirty-hour position. Yes. But this is a full-time position. So this would be Correct. six yep. point seven. Yes, that's correct. And we cut this position a year ago, correct? This is uh, replacing the position that was cut uh, the previous year. Um, there, there's things that are just not being able to be done uh, with the current manpower. Thank you. Apolney High School has requested an addition of a consumer science teacher. Uh, that's an estimated cost of $71,000 with salary and benefits. And that's for a full-time position. And how long has it been since that position has been filled? This is the first, this year. Is the first year. This is the first year that it hasn't been filled? Right. 
And what's the desire to bring it back? I think it's a valuable program for our students. Um, it's you know the life the life skills piece of it as well. Just with it's more than just the cooking and the sewing. Um, they kind of help out with the health aspect of the drug and alcohol awareness and it's also like a, a financial piece for that. In the past we have done, depending on who we get, but in the past two teachers we've had have had science backgrounds, so they've been able to do like a food science program so students can get a science credit um, and doing the hands-on stuff, but I just, it's a, uh, our teacher resigned at the end of last year and it was just, um, we were looking for a social studies teacher as well. I was trying to, Jay and Jen can, un, can vouch for this. So I've been saying, you know, if we can kind of share teachers or share staff or something like that to get, um, but we filled that position with a social studies position and now we're hoping to try to get that. Um, we don't want to lose that program. We don't want to lose our family consumer science. Um, so you filled this this position with the social studies position that went unfilled the year before. Okay. Yeah, because we had three, we were down to two, and our middle school has almost our middle school has over ninety students. So we were trying to do a full time middle school with ninety kids plus our full high school with just two teachers, and it was especially last year with COVID, we were having almost over 25 kids in a classroom. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Proctor Elementary School, uh, this is an additional 8,000 in technology for Chromebook replacements. And when was the last time Chromebooks were updated at Proctor Elementary? We do it on a yearly basis actually. Um, and, and talking with Greg and Neil, there's another round. We do it every year. So is it eight thousand or eight thousand dollars every year for Chromebooks at Proctor Elementary? I don't know the cost every year, but I do. No, Chromebook, Chromebook prices are going up. So um, that's just the, based on the amount of students this year is just the projection to next year. And where we usually had two hundred dollar Chromebooks, now we're looking at three, three fifty and waiting for them to be assembled. So um, it's just some proactive increase increases based on the way the prices are going. So how is this only a cost in one school then? This is the only school that requested these funds. Yeah, historically, uh, Proctor Elementary's budget has been lower than other schools in relation to the amount of students. And that usually was a pivot when uh, more and more Proctor funds are available to fund Chromebooks. Good question. So are Chromebooks built into everyone else's budget? They all have a technology budget. Some they're not all equal. Some are larger than others. So that, why is it if everyone's built in? How how is this a pullout then? Why wouldn't this just be a common build into Proctor Elementary budget? Well, it is built into their budget, so it's increasing their technology line from seven thousand to fifteen thousand to cover the uh, a replacement cycle. So this wouldn't be a one-time increase. It would be. Uh, so that they can do a two classroom cycle each year. So without me going through everybody, every school, what's, um, what are other line items, or other technology line items for other schools? So what you're telling me is that her line item has always been too low and now you're increasing it to be in line with all the other schools? Yes, this was specifically my recommendation. West Rutland has 48,000. Uh, Proctor High School has about 17, 18,000. Proctor Elementary School would have 15,000 after this increase. Pulteney High School has 47,000. And Pulteney Elementary School 
Okay, thank you. Mike has a question. I was just curious, Greg, do we lease those Chromebooks or are they ours? They're ours. So what do we do? Uh, leasing usually, yeah, usually, since we repair our own Chromebooks, um, the technicians are pretty adept at that, so um, I ran the numbers very, uh, like something like seven or eight years ago, and it, it just doesn't pay for us to uh, uh, hold a support contract like that. So what do we do with the Chromebooks when they're not being used anymore? We give them out to the community or we e-waste them if it's um, a security issue end of life on the machine. Thank you. So with the numbers you just gave, Holtney High School is 47,000, but West Rutland, which is a K through 12, is only 48,000. The numbers are odd, I think. And how many classes is this replacing every year? Is it two classes every year? No. Are, are you are are you factoring in that you're going to replace? I'm not asking if it's going to be 40 kids. I'm saying, is it going to be? two classrooms every year. Is that what you're budgeting it up on? Well, there's a lot of variables here which um, I don't, I'm not prepared to have the data in the failure rates in relation to what's being damaged and the Chromebooks we lose per building per year and, you know, the replacement parts and the time related to repair them and all the rest of it. So, there's not just one moving piece. It's not a direct correlation between two grades and their populations and placement. I always consider, just for the sake of numbers, 25 students per class who are placing two grades completely. That's just a general rule. And if we get more mileage out of it, then, you know, so much the better. Um, you know, the Chromebooks are constantly being swapped out as they're damaged. And since there's one ten technician per three buildings, they have a repair queue, you know, and sometimes it's, it's good to have a bank of Chromebooks that are configured similarly to the ones that are in use, and you just swap them out, swap a new one in, and then it goes into the repair queue. So it's, it's all kind of based on the ebb and flow of the, you know, the way the building utilizes the technology. And you know, the increase or decrease in student populations. That's just one very Sarah? I was just going to ask if the technology budget line covers, it is, is that just for Chromebook replacement cycles or does it cover other items as well? It covers all technology purchases. But not that one line item. You, sometimes it's broken up in supplies. Sometimes it's Excuse me, and in repairs, sometimes it's you know communications. There are several different line items in the technology yeah. area. But yeah, the line that there was the line that they're specifically referring to is hardware usually used from. Okay, I was just curious if the, the larger numbers, since they were read out for every school, the larger numbers. I was curious as to whether those encompassed more than just the Chromebooks, and it sounds like they do. Yes, they do. Okay. Like, if we lose a server, uh, if the, there's not enough in the repair budget, I'll take some from the equipment line. Or if towards, as, as the year goes on, and it looks like our Chromebook numbers are adequate, then we can go to the principals and say, okay, you've got this much left in the budget, would you like, what, what are the needs in the building? Oh, I would like another interactive panel. Well, because my projector died. And then we can start looking at add-ons uh, based on those kind of ones. The amounts that I gave was a combination of both supplies for computers and some general supplies. So I just added the two numbers up. Uh, the other thing I'll just add is that those, those amounts, some have, may have been adjusted post-merger and some not. Uh, so when we merged, I mean, each school was coming in with their different amounts pre-merger. And not every line item in this budget has been changed to reflect uh, the new Glory Valley districts. Um, so there's not complete, um, so not every line reflects like a per student amount for each school. 
Okay, and that was the clarification. It seems like what you're doing then with Proctor Elementary is actually bringing them up and putting them the number on the line that should be there and what's happened in the past, um, the budget has relied on local grant funds. Correct. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Mm -hmm. uh, Proctor High School, two additions. Uh, the first one is a full-time council slash behavior position. Uh, it's currently budgeted at 70000 in this budget. And then the second one is the addition of a part-time office assistant. That position is currently working right now. Um, it was added earlier uh, this year. But it's not something that was in this year's budget, so it is an addition for the FY23 budget. Okay. And so when we talk about full-time counselor behavioral position, and we can talk about this in executive session, are we talking about a restructure then, or are we simply talking about an additional person? So I'm talking about an additional person there was at Proctor, like you would know probably so three years ago, like a team of students that was dealing with behavior. I'm looking for more of like a boots on the ground position that works directly with students, either as a behavioral interventionist, which is kind of hard to find sometimes. Sometimes you're better off finding like a social emotional counselor that can work with them, push into classrooms, um, be working with teachers so that we can keep our kids in the room learning at the same time. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. And then for West Rutland, two items is a replacement of the heating system controls, um, also known as a JACE, and, and that's got an estimated cost of $70,000. Uh, and then adding uh, 35000 to the books for instruction for a, a new reading program. And what is the new reading program? So the new reading program is a program that we've had for the last two years that is called My View. It is a K to six program. Uh, West Rutland has never had a reading program uh, in recent history. And it is something that our test scores uh, clearly show that we need to work on unifying our reading program. Uh, so we have uh, chosen after the last couple of years to do My View, we did a soft increase uh, a couple of years ago where I just took money from another source and purchased the program. Um, I always am conscientious about a program that has a lot of consumables. My view does have some consumables in it. But again, this is a, a K-6 to program that's affecting about 175 children. Um, uh, so we're hoping uh, that once we really get into the program, we're going to start to see an increase in uh, our literacy uh, scores. So I'm presuming that $35,000 for books are books within each classroom? No, that, that is soup to nuts for, yes, for every classroom. There are consumables, uh, which is a, uh, a workbook for each child. There are also materials for the children. Uh, that they use also some are which are can be used year after year um, and as I said the last couple of years I've been kind of just moving money around to help pay for it but um, I'm wanting to go ahead and do a real commitment to literacy at West Portland School it was the program that our staff after a lot of vetting has uh, decided to go with. And do we know what the annual fee then is if, if there are cons like you said, workbooks and things like that. What's the uptick to this for the following year? You know, it's going to be somewhere between 25 and 35, depending upon the actual um, number of children that we have at the school. So it's actually a per, per child purchase. It's not a flat rate. 25 to $35,000 a year? Yes. So everything you're buying every year is used? I, 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 I guess yes. I'm... So when we purchase the program, there are also, there's also an online component to this as well, which has been actually very beneficial during uh, remote learning. 
but yes, there there are definitely consumables that fit into this. Uh, that that that's my my last school, which was a little was quite a bit bigger, probably double the number. I was spending seventy five thousand on a math program a year. Um, we're not even close to that at West Rutland. How many different reading programs do we have through Cory Valley? That I do not know. Uh, I I cannot answer that. What's the program at Proctor Elementary? So for our primary K through three, we use foundations and also our beginning team. Um, and then we just have a little workshop model for the rest of the school. So we don't have a program, but it's K6. And what about Pulteney Elementary? Pulteney Elementary uses foundations, grades K through two, and as an intervention in grades three. And we have Reading Street, grades two through six. Okay, thank you. For the, for the record, I do want to say that we are using foundations grades K to 2 as well. Okay, thank you. The one commonality that we really pushed for uh, this year to have that common uh, experience for the children. Great. And also, Lindsay Ryder, our literacy coach for the district, is working on, um, I would say, mainstreaming the literacy between our schools. And Chris can speak more of that, but I do know that's been a big focus, and she's going in and observing schools. I'm across the SU to, to get some consistency across the students. Okay. Kristen Ross? Um, that was kind of part of my question was, are we looking at across the schools, how we're all doing it, what are our programs, and then it sounds like that we're working on that, so that's great. And then my other piece was, do those programs, foundations, and the other programs, do they have the similar kinds of costs? Is, is this, you know, sort of, what you pay for these kinds of programs across the board or is there something in particular about this one day that you have found super beneficial for using it the last I think is it two years or a couple of years yeah it's actually just been two years so it's hard to say that we've got longitudinal data uh especially during covid uh if lisa madison's on the call she can tell you what foundations goes for i know i think we spent about thirty thousand dollars this year but we also this was our first year so there were a lot of things that needed to be purchased with that that were one-time only purchases um i see christy nodding her head too yeah foundation has very limited consumer work there's not work books that we got to pick up and just burn buildings kind of a one down type of thing as well yeah if you look at the books lines for the other schools, they're not that much. I'm not sure how much of that book line is being spent on, on their reading programs, but they are small. What page are you on, Lewis? Uh, so like Fulton Elementary School would be on page two. Under instruction, they have 10, um, actually it's, it's room. They have 10,000 budget. My proposed budget is bringing it to 7,500. Um, at Proctor, I think they only have a thousand of the books. Um, that's on page six. Um, they have 1,100 budgets of books and 2,000 for software. Mm, but that's not just literacy, correct? That's correct. That's math. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so just moving on to just uh, quickly through the not going to go through all the detail, but just a, a few things I'll point out. Uh, so starting on page two, uh, there's, a, there's a few places where you'll see in the budget where the lines are highlighted that just represents that uh, they're pending. I don't have actual amounts yet. We, will, we should have those by the next draft in uh, December. Uh, so at the top of page two is our revenue, which is up about 4%. Uh, it's mainly due to an increase in surplus as well as an increase in tuition revenue. Um, and then if you go through um, the expenses, uh, that also starts on page two. It's broken down by school and then by function and then by object. So you'll first up Pulteney Elementary School, then Pulteney High School, 
and then Croft Elementary School, Crawford High School, and then West Rutland. And then within each school, there's um, each function is uh, the pretty much the, the, the department, and the budgeting tool will give you some of that information as well. So like instruction, health, health department, uh, <coughs> principal's office. Uh, so going through the columns, the first column is the actuals from last year. Uh, the next column is FY22 budget, that's the current year that we're working in. Uh, FY23 budget, that's the one that we're looking at for, for this year, um, that's next year's budget. And then the variance would be the, the difference between FY23 and FY22. Uh, going on to page <coughs> page 12, uh, starts district-wide. Those are expenses that are not school-specific. Uh, and those include things like uh, Gourbet, fiscal services, plan operations is at the district-wide level, um, transportation, and, and bonds. Uh, and then uh, so we talked about the totals on page 14. Uh, page 15 is the, a summary of our tuition that's coming in uh, based on each, each grade and, and the towns that are tuitioning in. Uh, so currently we're estimating one, uh, 1 million 398,000 in tuition revenue. And then uh, page 16 are our regular billbacks. These are positions that are funded level and then build back to the city because a portion of their salary is grant funded. Uh, so we have a, a position at Holy Elementary School that's covered 50% through the CFP grant. Uh, we have a position at Proctor Elementary School that's funded 50% through special ed. Uh, we have a position at Proctor High School that's funded, uh, funded 80%. Oh no, I'm sorry, it's, it's in 0.8 FTE funded 30% through CFP and the other 50% uh, is at the local level. And then we have a position at West Rutland that's 50% CFP and 50% local. And then the last two pages of the budget are the special ed billbacks. That's um, what we talked about earlier as the disallow. So it, you can see uh, all the positions, the special ed positions for each school and the percentage that were estimating that <coughs> special ed um, ineligible. Any questions about the budget as a whole? Something that we can cover. Lewis, I just have a question of a number at the very the last page, page 18. Um, you, you just kind of said it, but I was kind of lost in my scrolling here. Um, the special ed bill backs at the bottom there, you have like over 7,000 for Will Spring, around the town, Corey Valley. Um, and then there's the Corey Valley total. Um, does that mean all except for those Will Springs, around the town, and that other Corey Valley line is 29.5? Is that three hundred and eighty-five thousand? Is that from all the other gray, the, the gray highlighted bars from above? Is that that total? What that total is? Yeah. So each school has their subtotal, and yeah. then the last um, section is shared positions across the SU. So that's our SLPs, OPs, PTs. Um, so those, they're not school specific. Uh, so those are uh, the way we did those. We have the total disallowed for those positions, which is forty-nine thousand. And, and we assess those, as, as an estimate for now, we assess those based on the assessment percentage or the assessment allocation that each district is paying. So that $29,593 for those shared positions gets added to each of the school totals <coughs> to get to the total of 385 for Porter Valley. Okay, thanks. Okay, Lewis, what else did you have? Uh, so, so for double budget, we can move on to the next topic, which is uh, the van replacement. Mm -hmm. uh, so this topic came up uh, at the SU meeting last month. Uh, there was a, a vehicle that 
was a special ed vehicle um, that was originally stationed at Proctor High School uh, that was moved to West Rutland based on need. Uh, West Rutland was using that vehicle and there was an accident back in October it was totaled the vehicle. Uh, so the insurance company sent us a check for approximately $9,000 to cover the cost of that vehicle. Uh, at the SU board meeting, uh, to replace that vehicle, we proposed doing uh, a mixed-use split with uh, 50, approximately 50% uh, special ed funds using that insurance check and then 50% coming from Cory Valley, which would be a regular ed usage. Uh, there were some concerns that were expressed at the SU meeting with the, um, be, because the vehicle was going to have uh, mixed usage crossing over to districts and, and being funded by two different districts. Uh, it was a table to discuss at the Cory Valley meeting. Uh, since then, um, we've uh, discussed it and reevaluated and would like to bring up a different proposal, um, just keeping both lines of money separate. Uh, what I'm recommending is to, if, if the board approves putting the 20% or, or some fund, some set of funds into that athletic fund from the surplus, we'll be using that athletic fund to purchase a vehicle for Core Valley, uh, which would be used for co-curricular and extracurricular activities. It would be um, strictly a Core Valley vehicle. It would be shared amongst all five schools based on, on the needs. Um, like I said, the priority would be for current um, extracurricular and co-curricular transporting students to, uh, from one school to another, to participate in sports or, or transporting them to sports if they're if they're smaller teams, um, if there's clubs or school-based clubs or something that that are traveling, they they can use the vehicle for that. Um, so, uh, so my my. Um, suggestion would be to use those athletic funds and purchase that vehicle and then aside from that um, the SU is also looking at purchasing vehicles for special ed out of a special ed grant uh, that we're receiving this year through our money um, we're looking at purchasing either one two vehicles <clears throat> we currently have one special ed vehicle in the SU we had two until the accident the one vehicle we have left is at Brooklyn Town uh, it is an older vehicle. I believe it's a, um, I believe it's a 2010. I'm not positive about that. We purchased them both at the same time. The other one that was in the accident was a 2010. <clears throat> uh, so that one is aging. Um, not sure about how much life it has left in it, but uh, it definitely is still working at this time. Uh, but just due to the size of our issue, um, we think it's time to to add at least another vehicle to 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 the SU to, to meet our needs. Uh, but that's something we'll discuss at the SU level. But I just wanted <clears throat> to give that explanation just because it did come up at the SU meeting and, and did affect Cory Valley. So does Poultney or Middletown or Wells, they don't have any special ed transportation? Poultney Elementary School currently has a student that's being transported for special ed and we're using one of the trucks that we purchased with the ESSER funds at this time is because there's not um, a, there's not a special ed vehicle available. Okay. Sorry, I, I may have said ESSER funds. It was it was purchased with COVID funds. It was CRF funds. It was prior to prior to ESSER. Okay. Question. Yeah. Jay, how does this affect you? Right now we're doing fine, Mike, um, and that's only because circumstances have changed. So we do have a school-owned van uh, that was purchased with non-special ed funds. It's also about 10 years old, um, and we just had some, some work done to it. Um, had circumstances stayed the same, we would be in a very different predicament. About a month ago, we were in dire strait. Um, but, um, some things have happened that I would not be able to say in open session, but we are doing, uh, we're, we're making out with one vehicle at this time because of the need. There were some repair issues with the van that needed that the other vehicle that West Rutland had, uh, and we were waiting for parts to come in. That was part of the concern. Uh, we spoke with the Ford dealership, 
um, after the SU meeting, and they offered for us to use a vehicle at no cost while the West Rutland band was being prepared. Nice. Thank you. So are you looking for action this evening, or this is simply informational? Uh, we don't need action tonight. It, it is mainly informational and follow up to last meeting. But if that is something that the board is looking for us to move forward with, if, if they um, uh, uh, feel that there is a, a need and agree that there's a need, um, then I can start that process as soon as the board approves that. Okay. There might be some end of year um, deals. What are the chances? I think we've talked about this before that car, you know, even used cars or new cars are sort of hard to find. I don't know about immediately around here, but um, do you see getting something immediately? <laughs> or yeah, I would recommend that we order it, which will take a couple months. Yeah, okay. Okay. Anything else, Lewis? That's, I hope, that's all I have for now. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on to committee reports, communication committee. Uh, so we did not have our recent meeting. We had to reschedule that. Um, so we're meeting at the end of November. Uh, so I don't have anything specific to report beyond what I had last month. So um, we are going, our next meeting is the 30th of November and uh, the plan is to start filling in some of the um, pieces of a larger communications plan, but also looking at hopefully the, the finalizing the data from the, the survey that we that we had. So, and I frankly haven't looked at the survey recently to see how many any new respondents we have, but I think it was pretty much slowing down a few weeks ago. So, um, I think at this point we should probably take what we we can get. <laughs> And look at it and start thinking about um, so what do we do with that now so um, okay yeah so we have a priority list we're working on but we haven't had another meeting uh, this month yet all right thank you all right moving on to policies we have a load of policies and some of them are first read and some of them are second read so the first read policies are simply policies <clears throat> if you have any suggestions or changes and that would be for excuse me before board commitment to non-discrimination is a first read c2 public participation at board meetings is a first read f6 transportation is a first read and f11 limited english proficiency students is a first read any suggestions, changes, concerns to those that need to go to the policy committee? And if you don't have them this evening, you can email them to either Chris or Eric, who is the chair of the policy committee. Kristen as well. <coughs> oh, is Kristen on policy? Yeah, Kristen Ross. Or Kristen Ross, who is also on policy. <clears throat> the following are second reads, so a motion will be in order for those at the end. Um, F11, oh, I'm sorry, wrong. A1, the role of policy. A2, policy dissemination, administration, and review. B3, board member conflict of interest. C1, board meeting agenda preparation and distribution. Um, F12, weapons and firearms, and this one doesn't have a number. Prevention of sexual harassment as prohibited by Title Nine. So a motion would be in order to approve the second read policies. Can I just ask a quick question? Sure. I apologize. So for the second read policy, this is approval with, with without changes, in other words. Correct. As as they are presented. Okay. Thank you. Sarah, do you have a question on uh, one of the policies that you want us to take a look at? Or? I did, and that's why yeah. I was okay. asking. I just, I'm sure procedurally, yep. um, but, and I, it was probably that I was not 
um, on the board during first read. So, can you tell us what policy it is? Yep, yeah, sure. F12. It is F12, um, right? You can see when I'm scrolling through. It's the weapons and firearms policy. I think it was F12. No. Sorry, F12. Thank you. Okay. And what page? Two. Okay. The section that reads sanctions. Okay. And yeah, so uh, do, 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 do. so the in the sanction in the sanctions section, which lays out a process for students who bring a weapon but not a firearm, right? So it says weapon, not a firearm but in parentheses to school. Um, there's a fairly detailed process for that laid out. I didn't see a similarly detailed process described for students who bring a firearm to school. Um, the last sentence of the paragraph kind of hints at a hearing process, uh, perhaps for, for students who bring a firearm and a different sanction, um, expel them for one year. Um, but I was kind of surprised not to see a detailed hearing process provided for a student bringing a firearm um, because that's specifically excluded from the rest of the paragraph. Um, if it's the case that the process is the same, essentially, for uh, a student to bring a weapon, not a firearm, and students to bring a firearm, um, and only the sanction is different, then I, I would just suggest that needs to be clarified um, so that we have a sense of what the process is for students who bring a firearm. referencing back again to the statute justice because otherwise it it, it yeah. seems a little unbalanced that we're not describing a sanctions process for for that group of students here but i totally understand what you're saying about the change so. yeah no i think that's a good idea chris i don't know do you have any no i i you know, Sarah shared this with me earlier today, and I think in looking back, I think we do need to clearly spell out um, a, a separate section in the sanctions with regards to a firearm. Or uh, I know when I looked at this, I, I think I also listed as a destructed device. Uh, so I, I have some language that we can quickly bring back to the policy committee to, for review, and then we can bring this one back to the, the boards in uh, December if we want. Uh, but I do think, I, I, to be honest, I think with something like this, I think we, we want to make sure it's clearly stated as opposed to hinted at or having somebody try to find it. And I think if, if just some language is being added to the sanctions just for another section in regard to a firearm or a destructive device, then I think that if that's going to clearly, you know, line out what happens, then I think we should go that route. So, but, uh, but like I said, it's, you know, it's up to the board and I have no problem doing that. I can provide the next policy committee meeting. So. All right, what is? I'd like to make a motion okay. specifically for F12 
that it be set aside, sent back to policy committee to let them review to bring forward again for us to review at a future date. Is there a second? No one wants to second that? I'll, I'll, I'll second it. So I'll <laughs> say that sounds fine. I'm sure that, that would improve it. So. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. So back to approval then for all second read policies with um, out F12. Make the motion. Motion by Mike. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much, and thank you, Sarah. Uh, the next meeting is December 20th. Future agenda items should be sent to Chris or Christina. Christine, uh, by December 12th. And we do need to have um, an executive session for personnel and administrator evaluations. So we are going to, it's 7.22, we'll say we'll um, come back at 7.35, 7.45. Um, we need to let him pack everything up. So let's say um, check back at 740. All right? Lisa, who do you want in the executive session meetings? Um, what? Should they not be there, et cetera? I think uh, Jay and Joe Harrington for one discussion. Uh, are we doing that first? Yeah. Um, for the first, yeah, we'll, we'll bring Jay and Joe Harrington back and then all board members. Okay?